Good evening, everyone. My name is Esther McCabe, and I am your direct Director of Performance Programs here at the American Angus Association. I am very excited to welcome you to Angus University's next webinar, Capitalizing on Calf Health. And man, what a timely topic as we head into the spring season. With us this evening is Dr. A.J. Tarpoff, Associate Professor and Extension Beef Veterinarian at Kansas State University. This evening, Dr. Tarpoff will explain the importance of proper timing of vaccine administration and vaccination protocols. AJ is going to cover health from both the cow and the calf perspective, while really focusing in on how your investment in the health of your cow herd can add longevity, reduce illness and disease, and increase performance. To give a little background on our speaker this evening, AJ was born and raised in Edwardsville, Illinois, where his family owned and operated a beef processing plant as well as a steakhouse. After earning his DVM from Kansas State University, AJ worked at Alberta Beef Health Solutions in Alberta, Canada as the Associate Feedlot Veterinarian. In this role, he focused on whole herd medicine, conducted numerous research trials, led feedlot employee trainings, monitored disease transmission, and worked with federal imports and exports. Dr. Tarpoff has held his current position at Kansas State University since 2016. Now at any point throughout the webinar this evening, if you have a question, go ahead and submit that through the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. To do so, click on Q&A, type into the chat box, and go ahead and click send. We will be compiling those throughout the duration of this webinar, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation. Once again, thank you for joining us this evening, and AJ, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Dr. McCabe. It really is a pleasure to be here today, and I really get to talk a little bit about one of my major passions, which is calf health, and that's really what our goal is tonight. Uh, going through the progression of birth, the immune system, how the immune function changes as these calves go through the system from birth to weaning, from weaning uh, to either the feedlot or being raised as a replacement to stay within the cow herd. Uh, we're talking about really trying to produce and recreate productive members of our cattle society. And that's really what we're after, and that's the ultimate goal. And one frame of thought that I like to kind of mold around this is resiliency, okay? How do we build a resilient, robust calf that nothing's gonna you know, stand in its way to really perform and really it hit its ultimate merit, okay? And I like to refer to that as shocks, okay? Shock in your pickup, driving across a pasture. If you have to drive across a rough patch in, in a pasture, do you want a really good you know, suspension underneath your pickup? Of course, right? It makes you able to you know, go over those bumps, go over those divots, and you really you stay right on track and go to your ultimate course. That's what we're trying to do with our calves, okay? So think about every input, every investment that we put into our calves is really building that suspension under our calves that they stay on track, okay? They don't get thrown out of the, the old wagon, you know, uh, divots, okay? That's really what we're after. So it's, it's building that resiliency. So to start off with, let's touch a little bit about the immune system and everything I'm gonna talk about today is here right on this chart, okay? And the immune system of a calf changes over time, okay? So let's, and tonight we're gonna talk specifically from birth on, okay? Keep in mind that when a calf is born, it's born with a fully functional immune system, but it's naive. Think of the immune system as a muscle. Okay, in order for a mus muscle to get big and strong, it has to be under strain, has to be under stress, it actually has to work. It can be overworked, but we wanna make sure that we build the immune system and not overwork it or, or overstress it. Okay, now uh, what's interesting about the calf is it's naive at birth, but then we get this passive immunity from mom. That's the, calf's, the cow's colostrum. Uh, so with er, that critical period within the few hours of life, we, we, we are, able to actually pass that immune function directly into the calf. Okay, now those immune cells don't last forever. They start to decline over the next couple months, but that's exactly when our calf really starts to create its own active immune system to be able to respond to different challenges coming from the environment. 
Okay, that critical period of time is really what we're going to focus on because that's when we can interact with the immune system with some of our management schemes to be able to increase the immune function against some particular uh, pathogen targets. Okay, so this is really what we're going to talk about today. So to put this in another way, just to recap what I just mentioned, okay, uh, the calf immune, uh, immune system, naive at birth. Okay, it's been, uh, it's been uh, born from essentially a sterile environment into the outside environment. It has no protection. That muscle hasn't been strained yet, it hasn't worked yet. Okay, that's where it's critical to get the cow's colostrum absorbed as early in life as possible that will really act as the functional immune system for the first couple months of life. Then, after the first couple months, that's when the calf's own immune system really starts to take a hold. Okay, that's where it starts defending itself. That's where we build that robust robust protection, but it takes time, okay? And the calf's immune function isn't at its peak at that period of time. It can take up to two years for a calf's immune system to be fully functional, okay? So it's a go always a good thing to keep in mind that the age of these animals, it takes time to mature, okay? But we can still interact with that immune system at an earlier age. Now, by the time that the calf reaches about two to four months of age, we have maternal antibody coming up, its own immune system is taking off, that's about the same time that we start interacting during quote unquote branding time. And branding time is often the first time that we implement some of our vaccine strategies and might do some different things and first handling, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But let's start at birth. This is really where it starts, and it actually starts a little bit before birth with the cow, and we'll get to that as well. But I do want to start with colostrum. I think it's a good, critical time to really show the importance of early life, the importance of colostrum, and how it interacts the well-being and the productivity of that animal, even within the first couple hours of life. Colostrum, for those of you that, do, that don't know, it's packed full of pre-made antibodies. The cow itself scavenges its, its own body to be able to concentrate and pre-package, they have a pre-package formula that it's the birthday present to that newborn calf. Here is your functional immune system for the next couple, uh, couple months of life. We have the antibodies, we have energy from fat, we have vitamins, uh, and we also have ready-made white blood cells that are ready to respond to anything in the environment. It really is the magic gene that it's the one thing that truly is almost like a magic drug, but it has to be given at the right time and in the right amount. We need the quality and the quantity very early. Okay, how much does a calf need? Uh, you know, it, what you'll see all over the place is 10% of the body weight of the calf. In reality, it's three to four liters, about a gallon. Okay, so young calf usually split between two feedings of about a gallon of quality colostrum within the first couple of hours of life. I'm sure many of you have heard about 24 hours. A calf needs colostrum within the first 24 hours of life. Uh, well, that's a little bit incomplete. The gut lining is actually, it can, it, it's leaky soon after birth. Okay, that means that some of these big cells, these antibodies, these white blood cells, all these vitamins and fats can leach through the gut lining to get directly into the bloodstream where that calf needs it the most. Okay, now that gut lining starts to close, okay, soon after birth. Now by about nine hours, we have about 50% closure. Okay, so think about that. It's less efficient at allowing these critical components to get into the bloodstream. That's why we really recommend to try to have these calves up and nursing within the two, first two to four hours of life to ensure they get the most amount of colostrum, high quality colostrum, but also that it's very efficient at absorption. Now, what are the impacts? What happens if a calf doesn't get colostrum? There, there's actually been some lifetime and productivity performance studies done at US Mark uh, that actually followed these animals. Okay, well, what happened if they didn't consume, which is called failure or passive transfer? Well, is it a big deal? It's a huge deal. Okay, about six and a half times more likely to get sick as a neonate, usually with scours, and we'll talk about scours later. A little over three times more likely to get sick pre-weaning, generally with some type of respiratory disease or BRD. Uh, but they're, what's most important, they're also about five times more likely to die, okay, and to have a mortality event. And this also transitions and follows into the feedlot, okay? Uh, decre decreased productivity, more likely to get sick, finish at a lighter weight, decreased carcass yield. Okay, so there's a lot of reasons why this first few hours really help dictate the productivity of these animals. Critically important. Okay, hopefully these animals can get, get up and have fresh colostrum from their dam. 
If not, there are a lot of commercial products that are out there. If we have to separate uh, the calf early in life due to, uh, due to a, uh, you know, a snowstorm, we need to warm it up. We have some other issues going on. We need to separate the calf from mom. We don't know the colostrum if they drank or not. Okay, we do have some products that are available on the market today uh, that usually come in powdered form that we can mix with warm water. Uh, but I do like to throw out there are two different types. We have replacer products and supplement products, okay? The replacers are more expensive, as they should be. We generally try to shoot for uh, replacer products that have a little over uh, 100 IgG or immunoglobulin. You'll see that on the label. We try to shoot for over that 100 level. Uh, that gives about all of the immune cell function, functionality, that that calf will need to get a good start at life. The supplements are much cheaper, but they're about half as much. They truly are just a supplemental product. If we're concerned about the quality or the quantity that that calf might have consumed, that's where these types of products would, uh, would come into play. But that's for animals that are, that are up in nursing. We just want to give them an extra boost. So how do we ensure that good transfer? We talk about how important it is. If they don't get enough, well, what impacts colostrum quality? Okay, and a lot of that comes from the cow. This is where cow, year in, year out, 365 day a year, uh, days a year, care of our cow herd really impacts the colostrum, which, which affects the productivity of that calf from that colostrum there on. Okay, the age of the cow matters, okay? If we have to rank our colostrum quality and quantity, it goes kind of our middle aged mature cows, to our young cows, ultimately to our heifers, okay? Our heifers, this is the first time they've lactated. This is the first time that they've gone through this process of, of developing the udder and actually producing colostrum. They're also growing and developing themselves. Their immune system is still developing, okay? So it makes sense that heifers may have a little bit lower quality uh, colostrum. Uh, th but the big, kind of predictor on how good a cow is going to be with colostrum production is really body condition, okay? Lactation takes, takes a lot out of the cow nutritionally. They need to be able to have that background and have the body condition to be able to lactate, okay? And to be able to produce all of this. Uh, that's where we really monitor our body condition score in our cow herd prior to calving, months before calving making sure that they are, they are in proper body condition. Out of a body condition scores a scale of one to nine, we want them right in the pro productive period, which is kind of five to six, five to five and a half, right in the middle. That is our really productive level of having that cow. That's where they produce good milk. Uh, that's where they're gonna have a good calving situation. And that's really what, what, what we strive for is having our entire herd kind of right there in, in that five uh, body condition score. Now, as that body, if they start to get thin, Okay, that's on the lower end. So the lower numbers are thinner cows. Uh, for our beef cattle, if we start getting to four or even below, that's where we really have decreased quality and quantity of colostrum production. Obviously, there's a lot of other factors that affect good immune transfer, how much these calves consume, uh, delivery, whether they were born into a blizzard. You know, there's a lot of things that come into play here, okay? Uh, but one thing that we can directly manage day in and day out is monitoring our cow, ensuring adequate nutrition through all aspects of production, okay? To help illustrate this, there was a, there was a very nice study that was done uh, that actually showed body condition score of cow and how the serum IgG or the immune transfer that gets into the blood of those calves after they consumed colostrum, what level did they get? Was it adequate enough? And what was found is as the body condition score of these cows go down, their calves have less antibody transfer into their bloodstream, okay? And that critical tipping point is once they get into four or below. Okay, and that's where we really strive to have our cows an adequate body condition score, which is five to six, to ensure that good transfer. I mentioned cold stress, men mentioned about blizzards, and through, uh, for many of us uh, through the Northern Great Plains and in different areas all, all over the United States, uh, really had some, had some cold stress issues earlier this year. Okay, so I do like to throw in a quick little, a few tidbits about uh, warming up cold, cold stress calves. Okay, it's called hypothermia. Hypothermic calves are low temperature. 
Okay, normal temperature for a calf that's born, hits the ground, uh, should be running about 101, uh, 101 and a half, okay? We start to see symptoms of hypothermia and slowing of, of uh, diverting of blood. We can run into frostbite issues. We can see some of those problems as the temperature, the body temperature, internal temperature drops below 100 degrees. We can have some pretty severe issues once it gets below 94. Uh, once we get into the mid 80s, uh, some of these young calves can actually be almost comatose. They're still alive and they can be, uh, they can be brought back, okay? But it, it, it's, a, it's an emergency situation to be able to address these. Uh, my biggest recommend it, uh, recommendation is for producers to carry a thermometer with, uh, in your calving kit, okay? If you come across a, a cold calf, take, take a rectal temperature. You can use that thermometer to kind of gauge how severe is this? Do I need to take it immediately to the veterinarian or should I try to warm it up? And there's a number of different ways we can safely warm these calves up. Uh, the old tried and true is the floorboard heater of the pickup, the defrost. Okay, we can put them in the passenger side of the pickup. Uh, one thing I like to do is almost take a, a piece of cardboard and lay over the top of them. Uh, so that defrost will almost kind of turn into a, a warm air heater that circulates under there. They get dry, they get warm, uh, but it does take some time. We can continue checking other animals uh, while that calf is warming up in the pickup with us. Uh, other things that we can use, uh, heating lamps, warming boxes, things, things like that. Uh, if you're going to use heating lamps in the barn, be sure that it, 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 it's, it has a safety plug. Some of our newer heat lamps are uh, flame resistance. They can't break. Uh, they, they can be fire prone, especially once we warm calves up and they start getting a little bit more rambunctious. Okay, uh, a lot of questions come up about warm water immersion and actually putting animals into warm water in the bathtub, so to speak, to be able to warm them up. Uh, while this is very effective, it's one of our most effective methods for severely hypothermic calves, we do need to be careful. We don't put them directly into very hot water, okay? What we do is we put them into lukewarm water and raise the temperature of that water by consistently adding warmer water till it gets about 100, 101 degrees, okay? Uh, it does take time. It takes a lot of effort. We have to continually add warm water to do it appropriately. If we warm them too quickly, we can actually get cold shock. All the cold blood from the extremity of the animal goes back to the heart and can actually stall the heart. Okay, so in order to make sure that doesn't happen is we do have to slowly warm them. Uh, so to put this all into perspective, it can easily take one to two hours to properly warm calves uh, to, to really get them back to prime time, okay? Hopefully, uh, we can actually warm them first before administering colostrum if this is a newborn calf. Okay, so a couple of quick tidbits there. Let's move on as uh, the neonate period, okay? I mentioned earlier that scours is an issue early in life, and I think it's important to cover calf scours, just what it is, what are some things we can do within our management scheme to help control them uh, before going on to some of our, our other issues later in life, okay? So I do like to cover uh, calf scours. Uh, keep in mind, not all scours are the same, but we end up controlling them the same way. Uh, it's caused by bacteria, viruses, and protozoa. Okay, so many, many of our scour events are actually caused by a multitude of these, both viral and bacterial, or possibly protozoal at the same time. Keep in mind also that most of these bacteria, viruses, and protozoa naturally circulate within our cow herds, okay? These aren't foreign invaders that come in. Uh, these aren't unforeseen. Outside of salmonella, almost all of these, these pathogens are seen on, on many or, or if not all of our operations. Another good rule of thumb is when these different diseases, when these different pathogens actually come into play, okay? E. coli occurs very early in life, okay? Occurs within the first uh, couple days, within the first week or so. Uh, that's when we see E. coli. Rota, Corona, and Crypto are some of our most commonly found uh, calf scour issues. And that really happens from about a week to about three weeks. And that's kind of our prime time we try to control, uh, especially some of the outbreaks of these animals. Um, not all animals are affected the same way. Usually, it's the calves born later in the calving season. It's the last third of our cows to calve. Those are the calves that end up having more of this issue. And a lot of it has to do with buildup of pathogens in the calving environment. So I, I think it's always important to talk about biosecurity. How do we control the pathogen, reduce the amount that, that ca newborn calves are exposed to? Uh, what are some management things that we can do to control this? Okay, number one, yes, calve in a clean environment, the solution to pollution is dilution. Okay, uh, the pathogens are spread usually through manure. 
So where, do, where does manure build up in our calving areas? Well, where our cows hang out, okay? Our cows spend the vast majority of the time resting, whatever location that they're resting, usually if we have uh, windbreaks or shelters, that's where they congregate. They spend the vast majority of their time laying and ruminating. Uh, other areas that build up with manure, okay? Where they drink and where they eat, okay? Those are kind of the three areas they spend the most time during the day. So if we have the ability to change some of these locations, change our feeding, plate, uh, our feeding sites, we can roll out hay. We can feed in different locations through the pasture where we can actually spread out these pathogens over a much larger area, okay? That, that's, a, that's a, you know, it's easier said than done in some circumstances, uh, but that's a great management way to be able to spread out these pathogens, okay? It's really minimizing the contamination. The other critical aspect is amplification, and I'll explain. Older calves born earlier in the calving season get exposed to some of these pathogens that circulate at a low level, okay? They don't get sick, but they, they take in these pathogens and the pathogens amplify on the inside of these calves. And these older calves serve as a reservoir and they produce a tremendous amount of pathogen into the environment. Okay, knowing that these, these older calves are the amplifier of these pathogens, we can do something about that. We can separate calves by age. Okay, e even if we separate calves, uh, if we calve for a month and then uh, calve in a different location for a month, or separate those older calves and remove them from the environment, making sure they aren't amplifying uh, more of that pathogen. Any little bit to be able to segregate our calves by age, and once the youngest calf is about a month of age, we can put them all back together, okay? Greatly reduces the risk. Uh, I also like to point out, we need to be careful with graft calves, okay? Graft cows or graft calves. If we lost a cow or possibly lost a calf, uh, you know, not the fault of the cow or the calf, okay? But we brought a different animal in from another operation, okay? Perhaps we bought, bought a calf from an outside source to put on to a nice cow, okay? Because we didn't want her to fall out of the herd. Well, if that's the case, that particular path could could be bringing in different types of pathogens our animals aren't used to, okay? So if you are gonna do some of that, things like quarantine, I'm, we're, we've all been, been accustomed to quarantine and isolation with some of these terminology over the past couple months. Well, these are things that we use in animal livestock day in and day out. If we bring in graft animals, we really need to make sure we segregate them or quarantine them, isolate them from the rest of our herd for at least 30 to 45 days to make sure they, they don't amplify or introduce anything that our animals aren't used to. All of these aspects of cleanliness, spreading out contamination, uh, breaking the amplification cycle, these are the principles behind the Sandhills calving system. Okay, it really minimizes the contact uh, up to these pathogens by increasing the amount of space. And it segregates calf by age. And what it does is we start calving, uh, for those of you that ha haven't heard about the Sandhills calving system, here's the general breakdown. We start our calving season with all our animals in one pasture or paddock. Uh, we calve for a specified period of time. We move any cows that are still pregnant to the next location. We calve for another you know, two weeks or so. Uh, after that two weeks, then we move anything that's still pregnant to the next location. We calve out for another two weeks. And this is really, that, that's the way it's written in the book. We know it's highly effective, uh, but understanding the principles behind it and molding those principles to your own operation can be extremely beneficial. So again, it, it, we have to mold these principles and put them really into action. Uh, I know many, many producers calve in a very specific area because it has easy access to some of the calving facilities if we have to intervene, okay? So what are some other things that we can do? Well, that increases management, scraping manure, replacing bedding, uh, making sure we move pears out as early as possible to be able to decrease that contamination in that calving area. All of these are good biosecurity measures to decrease the risk. Now, if you do run into scour issues in that later part of the calving season, we have some sick ones. What are some good rules of thumb to follow? Okay, uh, number one is fluids. The calves, the main issue with the calf that causes the disease is they get dehydrated. They need fluids. And oftentimes when we catch it early enough, 
oral fluids, oral electrolytes can really go a long way. If you see the calf and it still has a warm tongue, it's been up and nursing, oral electrolytes can generally get us by. But if they're down, they have a cold mouth, and we're in cold weather, that's more critical. Okay? They may need IV therapy from the local veterinarian to be able to bring them back. Okay? We really need to get as much fluid into these animals to help save them. Okay? Uh, the other question comes up is, well, do we need to run diagnostics? Do our veterinarians need to take samples? And a good rule of thumb to follow is if we have more than one animal, we're starting an outbreak, so to speak, it's not a bad idea just for uh, peace of mind to be able to get some samples sent into the diagnostic lab, either from fecal samples your veterinarian can take, uh, or, or uh, samples sent in from possibly an animal that, that, uh, that we had a mortality, that the animal actually died from the disease, to be, really understand what pathogens are involved. Not necessarily we're, that we're gonna change our treatment or how we handled it, uh, most importantly it's for us. Some of these pathogens are called, they're zoonotic uh, pathogens. That means people can get them. We may change some of our sanitation to make sure that our, ourselves, our family members, and people that we interact with, uh, none of them inadvertently get sick. Okay, so that's the neonate. First month or so of life, that's when we really concentrate on calf scours. Um, now, as this animal ages, we had good colostrum, hopefully we're building a good immunity, and then this animal starts to age, the threat changes. Between here to weaning, post weaning, some of our biggest threat and the biggest threat to the cattle industry when, from a disease aspect is BRD, bovine respiratory disease. It's a multifactorial complex that's caused by a lot of different things, a lot of different pieces interacting, but it's pneumonia. It's calf pneumonia that's, that we really do, concern, uh, do have concern about uh, as this animal gets older. So here we are as this animal is getting older uh, let's talk a little bit more about the immune function because this is the period of time the animal's own immune system is really kicking in. It's starting to take off. It's starting to take control. The maternal antibodies from the colostrum are starting to go away, okay? Because they don't last forever. They start to decline over time. Okay, now what helps that immune function at this critical period of time? Well, husbandry. Okay, the day in and day out practices that we do really have an impact on, on the animal uh, when, when it pertains to the immune function and production. Quality nutrition, okay, what they're consuming, what, they're, what their dams are consuming, okay, critically important. Uh, environment, clean, comfortable environment, okay. Um, now, one interesting aspect is maturity. We ha always have to keep in mind that it takes time for these animals to mature. As they mature, their immune system does develop and get more robust. Okay, so we ha always have to kind of bear in mind if we're seeing health events, uh, keep in mind how, how old are they really? Okay, not how much do they weigh, but how, what's their true age? Okay, because that, that age really has a big impact on their immune function. And I do have in this list, list is vaccination. Okay, talk a lot more about vaccination later. And here's a veterinarian, I have vet, uh, vaccination a little bit lower on the list, okay? That's, that, that's, that's on purpose. Vaccination is a critical tool to be able to stimulate the immune system in it against certain pathogens, okay? But in order for vaccines to be effective, we need all the other pieces of the pie, okay? We need quality nutrition, we need clean water, we need good, uh, comfortable environments for these animals, okay? Now let's move to the other bar. Things that hurt the immune system, not only during this critical stage of production, once this animal's getting a couple months of, of age, but on all animals, okay? Well, stress. I loop everything into stress, right? Stress hinders the immune function, okay? Uh, now, we understand weaning is stressful. That's when we see some disease issues. Uh, but any other change to these animals normal, quote unquote normal, can be stressful. Changes in feed, changes in weather, changes in environment, transportation, management schemes, handling. Okay, all of these can potentially be stressful. And when we have compounding stressors, keep in mind they build upon each other. And when they build upon each other, they can hit that threshold where it causes immunosuppression. And immunosuppression means that, you know what, their immune system just isn't up to, you know, protecting the animal like it should. Okay, it gets overwhelmed. And that's what we're really trying to avoid. So here, here, this kind of illustrates this. This is compounding stressors. This happens every day, unfortunately, in the cattle industry. We may vaccinate, okay, and we boost the immune function. Fantastic, right? Does that solve all of our issues? Not necessarily, 
okay? When we potentially wean, ship, commingle, uh, we have a bad weather storm, we do all of, the, all of these other management schemes that stresses the animal, and all of a sudden we have compounding stressors that overwhelm the immune system, and ultimately we can, that can lead to disease, okay? So just think about this, how can we separate and how can we segment some of these stressors to allevi alleviate the stress as much as possible so they don't compound on, e on each other all at the same time? And that's our goal with calf health. So cat, uh, vaccines and calf health. Vaccines are fantastic. We have some of the best vaccines we've ever had in, the, in history. They work fantastic. They build protection. We know they work, but they're a tool in the toolbox, okay? We need to have a realistic expectation for what that vaccine is intended to do. And I have this illustration of a crowbar and a screwdriver. And I use this as, you know, we need to use the right tool for the job. I was working on my tractor the other day and uh, I, I needed to pry something. I, I, of course, I hit something and I needed to pry some metal away. Grabbed the biggest screwdriver I could find, which wasn't very big, and I started prying metal. Well, the screwdriver broke and I smashed my knuckles and I wasn't very happy with the quality of that screwdriver. And then it dawned on me, is this correct? I should have been using a, pro, a pry bar and not a screwdriver. Well, many times we, we often blame either a vaccine or something else, but we have to step back and, hey, what is this vaccine intended to do? It's intended to stimulate the immune system of a healthy animal, okay? So a realistic expectation, understanding that a vaccine can always be overwhelmed either by uh, com uh, compounding stressors or an overwhelming load of pathogen, okay? It builds us you know, protection, it gives us some of that insurance, but no vaccine is 100% effective in every situation. Okay, so realistic expectations. The other thing is vaccines, you know, they, they are an investment. We need to care for this investment. We need to nurture this investment. Make sure that we get the most out of this investment. And it all comes down to storage, okay? When we purchase them, whether you purchase them at the store, your veterinary clinic, uh, you purchase them and they get drop shipped to your house, okay? Making sure that they maintain proper temperature all the way through. Uh, vaccines are, you know, the quality control of production from all our pharmaceutical companies is very strict, okay? And they need to main be maintained in a very stringent temperature, which is usually refrigerated. Okay, and refrigeration temperature means 35 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, uh, it is critical the vaccines stay at that temperature. Okay, there are some situations if they get too warm, we can hinder the ability of that vaccine to function. Or if they get too cold and they freeze, we can have the same situation that can really hinder and actually uh, you know, take away the performance of that vaccine where the animals won't respond quite right. Okay, so if they're delivered to you, make sure that somebody is available to be able to pick those up, to be able to put them in, in, in the proper uh, refrigeration. If you pick them up from a, a, a store, a vet clinic, wherever you might purchase your vaccine, make sure that you, you transport them on, you know, with ice packs, without direct contact in a cooler, okay? Always transport in a cooler. Critically important to be able to do that. And then let's talk about refrigerators, okay? Are all refrigerators the same? I, I challenge each, of, each and every one of you tonight, what does your ranch refrigerator that you store vaccines in, what does it look like, okay? How old is it? Do you know if it functions correctly? Do you know if it maintains that 35 to 45 degree temperature, okay? If you start scratching your head wondering, okay, I, I challenge you also to go get a fridge thermometer, okay? You can get them from just about anywhere, uh, stores. Uh, they even have new digital ones that can show you minimum and maximum within a 24 hour period. Uh, those are a phenomenal tool to help, help protect the money we spent on that investment before we administer it into that animal. There's been a couple of studies that actually look directly at some of these refrigerators, both on ranch and in different, uh, different locations. Uh, and it, it's been concerning. In one study, about 25% of the refrigerators failed to maintain that, that proper temperature. In the second study, uh, we had 76% of these, uh, these refrigerators, uh, they were unacceptable for maintaining animal health products, okay? So keep in mind, go check your refrigerator. Use that, te that thermometer before you purchase your vaccine that you might store in that refrigerator, okay? Uh, because the last thing we wanna have happen is spend all this money for an investment in our animals and have an investment that is already spoiled, okay? It's already lost some of its usefulness, okay? And that's what we're trying to avoid. 
So vaccines, there's a lot of them out there, okay? Uh, they're modified live, there are chemically altered, and there are killed vaccines, okay? There is a time and a place for each and one of them, okay? Uh, in general, modified live uh, vaccines, they replicate on the inside of the animal. They mimic natural infection uh, the most closely, okay? They're relatively cheap, but they must be handled carefully. If you have to mix two different vaccines, okay, that would be considered a modified live. Once you mix a modified live, they have to be handled carefully, protect from sunlight, keep cool, but they're only good after you mix them for about an hour, okay? Some of our chemically altered, uh, some of these might be temperature sensitive, uh, which are being uh, more commonly found in some of our nasal vaccines, okay? Uh, a little bit more expensive, a little bit, uh, what we see a similar result, uh, generally a little bit safer because they don't replicate as much on the inside of the animal. Then we have uh, killed vaccines, okay? Killed vaccines, these would be like your black leg. Okay, uh, again, uh, very safe, very stable. Wanna make sure that they don't freeze especially, um, but may require several doses, okay? Because they're a killed product and they don't replicate, uh, it takes some, some other products in that, those vaccines that make them special called adjuvants to be able to stimulate the immune function, okay? So um, how do we make the decision? How do we know which products to use and where? And this really falls in the context of a veterinary client patient relationship okay, or a VCPR. Every operation is different. So having that, that discussion with your local veterinarian that understands your goals, understands your production, understands your animals, your area, the risks associated with the area, okay? This is what is really special about your relationship with your local vet because they can help walk through what products to use in, in different types of circumstances and with different classes of animals, okay? Now, protocols are great. Having this plan ahead of time is a, is a fantastic tool to work from, okay? They can change over time, but keep in mind, changes need to be made for the right reasons, okay? Uh, whether disease potential has changed, okay? Whether your risk as a producer has changed, uh, or purchasing, something as simple as purchasing has changed, okay? That's okay to change protocols over time, but you really need to measure the outcomes to ensure that they are actually working or if we're gonna make progress or not. Okay, so this is where we monitor things. This is where we monitor health and keep records so we can actually see how well our, our protocols are doing within our herd over time. So vaccines, while they're far and wide, why do we vaccinate? Why do we do these things? Okay, well, in general, I like to think things in big picture. Okay, we vaccinate cows to protect pregnancy. We try to protect that unborn calf even prior to conception. Okay, that's why we vaccinate cows. Okay, reproduction really pays the bills for a cow-calf producer. Why do we protect, uh, why do we vaccinate the calf? Well, we vaccinate the calf to protect against bovine respiratory disease, because that's really gonna be one of the biggest threats in its life is BRD. So we vaccinate cows to protect pregnancy and that unborn calf, and then after the calf is born, we vaccinate that calf to protect against BRD, okay? Uh, they're really insurance, okay? Uh, vaccines, are they gonna prevent absolutely everything known, known to man? No, what, they, what they're designed to do is really to prevent the big outbreaks, the big losses, okay? So we're paying insurance by utilizing vaccines appropriately to ensure that we don't have any big losses, okay? That's what we're trying to do with these. General guidelines, okay? What do we use and when? Again, that starts with a conversation with your local veterinarian. Number one thing to consider, we need a functional immune system to get a good response. A vaccine, when we vaccinate an animal, we challenge the animal's immune system. So we need a healthy animal to be able to fully respond, okay? When do we vaccinate cows? Really the most bang for our buck when we're vaccinating cows, mature cows, breeding cows, is pre-breeding. Okay, there are several different pathogens that can interact and cause early embryonic loss. And that's really what we wanna protect against. We can protect against some of those diseases. We can also protect against things like uh, BVD virus, okay, that can create PI or persistently infected animals early in, in gestation. Okay, so pre-breeding, we can challenge that animal, allow it to mount a response. So when that critical time frame happens during breeding and soon after pregnancy, that we have already built up our immune, immune response. They're ready to combat if there is anything circulating within the herd. So really that pre-breeding vaccine, before turnout of the bulls, before any of our AI sync, before any of those things, vaccinating our cows, 
that's where we get the most bang for our buck is that pre-breeding. When else would we vaccinate? Potentially at preg check, okay? We like to be efficient with things. Uh, when else would we have our animals gathered? Uh, usually during gestation, they're pregnant already. Uh, we might bring them up for a, if we're, uh, if we're gonna preg check kind of mid gestation, okay, well, we might booster her with a couple of things. And depending on your recommend, re, different recommendations, it could be something like Lepto or the, uh, the L5 types, types of products, okay, L3 or L5. We might booster some of those for protection against some of the, uh, the uh, issue, uh, pathogens that can cause abortion. Okay, so that's what we're trying to avoid. Uh, we can also use some things uh, like scour prevention vaccines. So we can use those to build and challenge the cow's immune system so it has ready-made antibodies to transmit into the colostrum for the calf. Okay, so that's what, how we vaccinate cows. What about calves? When would we vaccinate calves? Well, I, I, I mentioned it before, but usually the first time we handle calves is quote-unquote branding time. And branding time, whether you brand or not, it's the traditional time when the animal is two to four months of age, okay? Two to four months of age, that's a prime time to start interacting with the immune system. That's when maternal antibody is starting to drop. That's when its own immune system is starting to take off. That we can prime and stimulate that immune system in these young calves. Uh, that's a nice time to start implementing some of these strategies. One of the next most important times, in my opinion, is pre-weaning. Okay, usually a month, 45 days prior to when you plan to wean and separate from, uh, separate the calves from the mothers. Okay, that's a time that we can challenge the cow is, uh, the, the calf is comfortable, it's out with mom, it's out on pasture, life is looking good. We can challenge that immune system and have this big response uh, because we've already, we've, it, it's the second dose. Okay, the second dose and we get a much bigger response and I'll talk about why that happens. Uh, but really we're building antibodies prior to the risk. Okay, as much as possible, if we can time those appropriately, and I know it's easier said than done in some circumstances, there's a lot going on, but this is it in generality, this is what we try to get to. This is what we try to achieve these different time frames. Okay. Oops. Sorry, I hit something. Okay. Um, so one, one question that always comes up is branding time, okay? I try to work my calves, and some of our young calves are maybe a month of age. Doc, can I still vaccinate, okay? Here's a, a couple of things that we know. With the vaccines that are currently on the market, and there's a lot of them, and they're all, and there's, they're many, they're all very effective, okay? We get very reliable results in our young calves from vaccines when they're about two to three to four months of age, our traditional, you know, uh, that traditional time frame. We have some new data that just came out within the past year that has really showed that we can vaccinate some of these young calves against some of these BRD pathogens as early as a month of age and have very good working memory, okay? Uh, so we have that, it's proven, we know it works, we know we can challenge these animals with the pathogens and we, we, they have a bigger response, we know they work. Uh, work with your local veterinarian for some of those recommendations if we do have to give products to some of these young calves, uh, but rest assured that yes, we can still get a response, okay? We get memory production, which is what we're after with vaccines. What else might we, you know, what, th those are the time frames. The second question that always comes up is, okay, well, this time frame works great. What do I use? What do I need to protect against? What products do I need to choose? And this is where it's broken down into a couple of different segments. Number one, especially for our calves, is black leg, okay? Clostridial diseases. Uh, these are bacterial diseases that live in the soil, okay? All over planet Earth, they live in the soil. So there's consistently a challenge to these animals. Okay, calves that have never been vaccinated for some of these black leg diseases or clostridial diseases, um, they could be susceptible and they will be susceptible. Okay, that's, it's one of our cheapest, most efficacious vaccines that are out there and that's why we use them routinely. Uh, they can be found in seven ways, eight ways, even nine ways, okay? Uh, so clostridial diseases, when vaccinating calves, uh, both branding, pre-weaning, possibly even at weaning, uh, that's when we would definitely include something, uh, a multivalent clostridial. If you are castrating, okay, if uh, during branding time you're implementing management strategies for, uh, you know, calves that are going to go to feeding, commercial calves, making sure that we castrate, if you're going to band them, make sure that we have a tetanus on board as well, okay? Uh, the tetanus may or may not be included into that clostridial vaccine. It's something to ask your veterinarian about. 
Uh, the other things we protect against, the viruses, okay? The big ones, the respiratory viruses, IBR, BVD, BRSV, PI3, uh, you'll see them as five ways, okay? Those are the viral pathogens that, we, we, that have most concern for causing or a, a small piece of bovine respiratory disease. And we try to build up immunity against those. As the animal gets older, once we get closer to weaning, it's interesting, we actually have some Bacterin, which is a bacterial vaccine product, to help protect against the bacterias that actually cause pneumonia, okay? So these would be called, uh, in general, our Pasteurella, so to speak, okay? Uh, our Pasteurella vaccines, uh, you know, they're, they're respiratory Bacterins. They're trying to build protection against those particular pathogens. Uh, we find most commonly they get a, a implemented as the animal gets a little older. Maybe not at branding time, but definitely pro uh, probably pre-weaning or even at weaning is when we would implement these Bacterin type products. So again, management strategies, castration. I mentioned castration, timing is everything. Castration is a painful uh, procedure. We need to make sure that we do it as early in life as possible, okay? Um, a, a, one of my mentors brought up, uh, the longer these things are attached to the calf, the more the calf is attached to them, okay? And what that means, if we're gonna castrate, we need to castrate in early, as early in life as possible. Okay, preferably within the first uh, couple days of life, if you catch them and tag them, that'd be a prime time to be able to do that. Uh, for sure at that branding time, two to four months of age, um, trying, to, trying to get that done as soon as possible in life uh, will be the, the least amount of detriment to the animal, the least stressful on that animal. So next I'm gonna share some information from a survey uh, that was actually conducted. Uh, there, there are several different groups that worked together. We did a national survey on cow-calf uh, cow -calf veterinarians from all over North America. Uh, most respondents were from uh, the United States. We had a few from Canada, uh, but we had, we had uh, well over 100 veterinarians that the majority of their business is actually with cow-calf production. We asked them, what are your recommendations? What do you recommend that producers actually use and to protect against, okay? And we broke it down into these different stages of production. Branding, pre-weaning, post-weaning, at weaning. You know, what, what do you recommend if, if everything was a perfect world? And at branding, what we find is similar to what, what I mentioned earlier. Okay, most veterinarians do recommend use of a multivalent clostridial as well as a five-way, okay? IBR, BVD, uh, BRSV, and PI3. That would be our general viral five-way, okay? That's really what's recommended at branding for most of our uh, cow-calf operations throughout the United States. Um, many of you may, might ask, well, what type? Do I wanna use a modified live or a killed? Um, most veterinarians, by most 88% of veterinarians throughout the uh, US did recommend, uh, did recommend usage of a modified live for these calves at branding time. Okay, now at, at branding or at weaning, there was a little bit of a discrepancy on, hey, if you have to castrate, what method of castration do you recommend? And the method of castration was a little bit all over the board, usually at branding, knife cut, uh, making sure that we remove those appropriately, uh, they heal up appropriately. Um, now, as we get closer to weaning, that's when things start to get a little bit sporadic. Uh, we're actually currently uh, currently finishing up a trial that we're looking at different methods of castration and how these animals heal and how long it takes to heal. Uh, regardless of the way that uh, veterinarians, the method of castration, uh, most veterinarians, 97%, do recommend at least a tetanus uh, toxoid vaccine if you're gonna ban them, okay? Uh, just produces a very unique area that's lower than body temperature that is primed for the tetanus to actually take hold. And tetanus is a pretty, very nasty disease. It's easily, to be, it's easily preventable if we're planning out ahead, okay? So if you're gonna ban, make sure that we have uh, tetanus uh, toxoid on board. As these animals get a little older, this is pre-weaning, 30 to 45 days pre-weaning. Do our vaccine recommendations as, uh, you know, veterinary recommendations, do they change as the animal gets older, once we get closer to weaning? And what's interesting is they don't change very much. We still recommend a clostridial, uh, the viral five way, but what's interesting is right here. This is where most veterinarians start to include Mannheimia hemolytica. 
This is a, a Pasteurella a Bacterin product to help protect against Mannheimia is the key component of bovine respiratory disease on the bacterial side. Okay, and that's why this toxoid is often chosen uh, to be able to boost this animal's immune system just prior to weaning when they know they're going to be stressed. And again, most veterinarians do recommend a modified life. So the question comes up, Doc, why do I have to vaccinate these animals so often? Okay, why do we need two shots of the COVID vaccine? Okay, that the reason really is, is an amnestic response. Okay, why we would vaccinate these calves, uh, both at branding, pre-weaning, the first dose almost serves as a primer, okay? We see a response, we build memory, okay? The second dose, when we interact with the immune system, the immune system is already primed to that vaccine. That means it's ready to respond rapidly. And when we get the second dose, that, that's really when we do see a massive response. We have a much higher level of antibody response. We have longer lasting immunity. That's why we have multiple doses. And especially with a young immature immune system with these young calves, that's where multiple doses and following the label directions is critical to ensure we have this amnestic response. So we have long lasting immunity and protection from these products. The other thing to consider is uh, not, not all calves respond the same way, okay? Uh, we have some groups of our animals, uh, possibly over here on the far left. Uh, you know, these animals may not, they kind of have a poor response. We can vaccinate them a hundred times and they just don't respond very well. That's the individual in them, okay? Uh, then we also have a, a group over here on the other side that we give, we give a couple of doses and they just have this phenomenal response. They have a massive protection, okay? They're, it's a very robust response and they just found that vaccine and responded great, okay? Those are the two extremes. The vast majority of our animals are somewhere in between. They have an adequate response and that's really what we're after. We want them to produce memory. They want them, we want those animals to have some memory and kind of pre-made response plans ready if they see these pathogens in the environment. So weaning, I mentioned weaning, very stressful, okay? There's some different uh, ways that we can decrease the stress. Some of these might be applicable to you, sometimes not, okay? There's some soft weaning methods where we can do some fence line weaning. We can do two-stage weaning with nose clips. There's some different things that we can do. Uh, but other simple management things that we can do are just, uh, they, they almost seem so, so simple, okay? We can acclimate the calves to the environment we're gonna wean them into. If we're gonna wean them into a feeding pen to be able to hold them for a period and then ship them, okay? If we have the cows and calves in that same location where the calves can learn how to eat, they can learn how to drink in that location before we separate them from mom, okay? Those are simple things that reduce the overall amount of stress on these young calves. Other stressful situations that need to be controlled, okay? Uh, internal parasites. Internal parasites rob our animals of nutrition and a lot of different things. Um, other things to be concerned about around weaning. Coccidiosis, okay? It's a protozoal parasite. It's where we see some blood in the manure. Okay, again, these are things that rob production and hinder these animals. So parasites, internal and external, should all be things that should be included into our overall herd health plan. Um, as for calf, there's no such thing as uh, calf health, there's no such thing as a free lunch, okay? Uh, but the closest thing that we have in the cattle industry, especially if you're growing uh, cattle for to be feeders, to be commercial calves that are gonna go into the slaughter chain, uh, go be fed out, uh, growth implants, okay? Unless somebody's paying you not to put them in, okay? Uh, we see about a 20 to one uh, return on investment from utilizing calf growth, growth implants, okay? We can usually put those in, uh, read the label, make sure you get the proper product in. Uh, there's only a handful of these that are recommended that can be used in calves on the cow, okay? But we do see the, we do see the performance gains. 20 to one return for every dollar that we spend on the, on the implant, we get $20 in return on increase in weight gain and improved in efficiency. So if that's something you're interested with, again, I highly urge you to visit with your local veterinarian about. Regardless of these vaccines and everything else, we can't forget about our husbandry practices. They're the most important thing that we have, and this is the most important practice that we can't forget about. Clean water, okay? Uh, the top pictures, which water tank would you wanna drink out at? 
uh, drink out of. Okay, when we're especially when we're taking animals through a stressful situation, we want to ensure quality feed, quality water. Uh, all the basics are become the most important thing on earth for those animals. Okay, uh, other stressful situations: heavy rain, mud, blizzards. Do we have a plan? Okay, heat stress. Okay, do we have a plan? Okay. We can mitigate some of the impacts on these animals by just working through having a pre-plan uh, pre in place to be able to put in, into, into production to make sure that we can mitigate those stressors. Finally, keep records, okay? Whether they're vaccine records, their treatment records, we're monitoring morbidity, year-to-year -year variation, Okay, uh, we have nutrition records, what we fed, how much we fed. We can go always go back, okay? It, it's always difficult to go back after the fact. Oh, you know, which, which animal got sick? How many got sick? And often it gets forgotten because we have so many other things going on, okay? Having a proper uh, treatment rec records, vaccine records, what you gave and when, okay? If you're looking for some, uh, you know, kind of some strategies, how, how do I record this? Go to your national BQA manual, okay, bqa.org. In the national manual, there are some recommendations on different ver uh, vaccine record sheets and treatment sheets uh, that you could use for your own record keeping. And also, most importantly, especially for our young calves that we may be selling, okay, marketing verification, okay. If many of you out there might be thinking, well, if we vaccinate them at this period and this period and do all these things, does that qualify for something? And actually, yes, in most situations they do. You may have to verify that with your veterinarian or another, uh, another individual, a third party verification. Uh, but again, marketing verification for preconditioning programs, okay? And that's essentially what they are. Uh, but a couple of questions for you. Is preconditioning right for you? And preconditioning can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. What I'm referring to are the verified preconditioning programs. And there are many of them out there. You hear them as the VAC programs, okay? Uh, some of them are weaned, some of them are unweaned, okay? So if you're trying to work through this flow chart, you know, what type of preconditioning program might be for you? Okay, do you have facilities to be able to handle these animals? Do you have facilities to be able to handle wean calves? Do you have the time? Do you have the labor? Do you understand the costs and risk benefits of, of, of these situations? Uh, and I think the most important, in my opinion, is have you found a specific, a specific marketing opportunity for these calves? Okay, because just because you did all of these practices, if that information is not conveyed to the, the buyer, often uh, you know, we, we don't get to reap those benefits. So is there value in preconditioning programs, verified preconditioning programs? There's been multitude of studies that have looked at this, and the answer truly is yes, there's profit return that's available to be able to uh, come back to the producer. Especially for wean calf programs, uh, what's interesting in, from an Indiana study over multiple years, they found that the vast majority of the income and the return back to the producer when dealing with wean calves where they're weaned and held for about 45 days is the biggest return on investment was the increase in weight gain, okay? So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we sell pounds. Okay, and if we can hold those animals and feed them for a period of time in a very efficient manner, uh, we get a big return on investment just by those added pounds that we put on those animals. Also, the premium for the lower health risk. We implemented these, these verified health programs with vaccines and different product usage, usages. You know, that brings a lot of, uh, you know, that, that brings a lot of understanding to the buyer, that they feel confident with what they're buying. Other value, again, seven to $10 premiums, you know, there, there's been a lot of different studies that have looked at this. Uh, more recently, and in, in, uh, some work that was done at K-State, uh, looking at some of the superior livestock data that really compared some of the different VAC programs. Uh, VAC 34, VAC 34 plus, these would be uh, uh, unweaned, uh, types of, uh, of VAC programs. And obviously, yes, they're becoming more popular. Within uh, 2010 to uh, 2018, through that period, about half of the animals within the, those superior data set uh, would have qualified for some, uh, one of these uh, VAC 34 programs. Okay, and yes, there was a, uh, about a $3, uh, two to $3 per hundred weight, um, you know, 
a value that was brought back from those animals. So that, that's what the premium kind of brings back. Some of our wean calf programs are starting to pick up in popularity. Um, and again, these will be weaned for about 45 days, but have the same amount of vaccines at multiple times during their lifetime. And while they're not quite as popular as the uh, VAC34, the unweaned programs, uh, they, do, they do bring more of a value added uh, proposition of about double, okay, up to $6 uh, or so. So again, is there value to be, uh, that, is there value from these programs out there? Yes, okay. Uh, do they happen all by themselves? No. You do need to do your homework, making sure that you have uh, discussed a lot of these, uh, these situations, uh, you know, with whom, whomever you sell, whether it's your local sale barn, you've talked to some of the different individuals, and you found the proper time to sell these animals, okay? So uh, with that, I'd like to kind of step back and answer some of your questions. I just thank you all for logging in tonight and being able to discuss, so. Thank you, AJ. Thank you. That, was, that was great information. You know the one thing that I walked away from with that is you really need to get a better screwdriver. <laughs> but seriously, that was great information and it's presented in such a practical and logical way for producers to use, so we appreciate that. Thank you. There's a lot of moving pieces to quality health, um, and to kind of summarize that a little bit, with some understanding, using good resources such as your veterinarian, and some planning, you can maintain quality health and it really does pay off. So we've had a lot of great questions submitted this evening. You guys can continue to submit those questions through the question and answer feature, and if we don't get those answered in the session this evening, um, AJ's been kind enough to agree to go ahead and answer those after this webinar has completed. So go ahead and send those in. If we don't answer them this evening, um, we'll get them answered. So are you ready for our first question? Absolutely. All right. On the Sand Hills calving system, can the cow-calf pair be moved and leave the calving cows instead to help reduce the amplification? Okay, so great question. So the idea behind leaving the pair is kind of twofold. One, if you've ever had to sort off pairs, sometimes it's difficult to get baby calf to go with cow. Um, but in reality, it, it, a lot of it comes back to the biosecurity, okay? The calf was born in one location, and if we just move the pregnant cows, that means the, the next group where the pregnant cows start calving again, it's a brand new clean environment, okay? Um, so, you know, it, it's it, you know one of the modifications. If you're calving in one location and you need to get pairs out, that's another ability to be able to break the amplification cycle. Okay, uh, but again, we need to be cognizant that you know, in, in a perfect world, so to speak, we just move the pregnant cows. Okay, if we can't do that, if we're calving in one location and that's what we're tied into, we just need to make sure that we get the pairs uh, out of there as soon as possible. Okay, when the calf is up and, and going, uh, but we can still run into, into scour issues out in pasture if we're putting just all the pairs out into the same location. So we do need to be cognizant of that if we can still separate those in, into smaller groups, okay, until we're done with the calving system. So hopefully that clarified that question. Yeah, I, yep. I think that makes sense. Good. Your next question is you answered this during your presentation, but we had a question. So what age do you recommend calves to be vaccinated? when should we vaccinate cows? Yeah, so no, uh, great question. So um, again, I'll start with the calf. So ideally we would try to vaccinate that calf in those different periods of time, branding time, two to four months of age, okay? Pre-weaning, about a month prior to, month 45 days prior to weaning, okay? At minimum, I think that's where we get some of our most bang for our buck. In some circumstances, we might just have, if we can't catch them early in life, sometimes we're kind of limited to, uh, you know, pre-weaning and at weaning, where we give the booster at that weaning time. Again, it would have been nice to have a primer early in life, but sometimes we have to work within our own limitations, okay? So we need to be realistic with that. Um, and then post-weaning, are there some situations where we would? Possibly, if there's gonna be another stressful situation, we're gonna uh, send them to the feedlot. Many times through, through production and through the system, those animals, if they go to the next stage, they're gonna be boosted, okay? So if they go to the feedlot, they might get boosted there. There's been a period of time that we're gonna get an added benefit of boostering them in that, in that period of time. As for our cows, Okay, and that's where it's time frames. Whether you're a spring calver, a fall calver, uh, we're gonna try to get um, that pre-breeding vaccine, okay? Month, 45 days prior to, um, you know, prior to breeding, which also coincides with branding time, 
okay, which is nice. We can do, uh, we can work the pair before they go out to grass and before the breeding season. Many times we can work those together and kind of knock out two birds with one stone. And then potentially, if, if we have that, and if we're gonna implement some of the other things, uh, that's where we can implement something during gestation, okay? With potentially a different product uh, for calf scours or potentially a booster uh, for some of our lepto products. Gotcha. Yep. Does the time of year affect how you manage calf health? So say for example, if calves are born in early spring or later in spring, or fall calves versus spring calves? Yeah, no, so great question. So the immune system, the immune function, and how it develops doesn't change regardless of time of year. What changes are stressors, okay? And whether we're a spring calver, uh, you know, and or I, I guess I should say winter calver, if we're calving in January, versus a May calver versus a fall calver, okay? Regardless of where you are on the spectrum, there are stressors. They're just a little bit different and the immune system develops the same way for all of those different calves. So what we do is, you know, try to handle those stressful situations, okay, which might be heat stress in, you know, kind of late summer, early fall if we're calving at that period of time. It might be blizzards if we're calving, you know, in February, okay? So there, there, we have both ends of the spectrum. Each of them have their own individual stressors but the immune system and the immune function, where we're gonna implement some of our vaccine strategies will be the same. Gotcha. Yep. Okay, to follow up on that a little bit, how much modified live vaccine should an ha animal have in their lifetime? Is there, is there a maximum number of times <laughs> you should administer that? So uh, in reality, not, okay? Uh, there, there's really not. And I think the question comes, and I'll take this on a limb, is if you've raised heifers and you've raised them from a calf, and you've put them through and they've had multiple uh, vaccines with a modified live. Uh, once they get to a point, they just stop needing a, a modified live again, uh, which I think is the ultimate question. And most veterinarians agree that even the year, yearly boosters, many, and I didn't share that information, I'd be happy to share that at another time, uh, but we have that published that most veterinarians still recommend, especially in that pre-breeding time, well before the breeding season, well before the AI, uh, sink or anything like that, uh, that the usage of some of those modified live programs are still uh, some of the most recommended in the industry. Uh, so even for a yearly booster. Now, is that absolutely necessary in every situation? You know, uh, maybe not, but having the, the animals uh, on a modified live and a lot of veterinarians' ideas uh, have other added benefits, especially when we start using the modified lives and the calves. Yep. Okay, so kind of segues nice into the next question, commonly asked question. Can modified live vaccine be used in the cow while the calf is nursing? Oh, in the cow while the calf is mm -hmm. nursing? Yes, absolutely. Okay, usually the question comes the other way around. Is, what uh, about the other way? Yeah, so, and so that, that, that's the risk, okay? And that, that's, it's written on the label um, that can we give a modified live to a calf if the cow has never had a modified live? Okay, and there has been, uh, you know, adverse events that have been reported and that is on the vaccine labels, okay, uh, that there is a risk to the cow and her reproduction. There has been a, a couple of documented cases that the viremia from the calf got transmitted to the naive cow, mature cow, because she'd never seen that vaccine strain and it interfered with her reproduction. Okay, uh, those are few and far between, okay, but it is documented, okay? So you always have to follow vaccine recommendations and the, and the recommendations from your local veterinarian on a total herd health plan, okay? That's why having this plan in place and knowing all the different pieces, that's why we can't do cookie cutter vaccine programs. Uh, that's why your veterinarian understands your, what you do on the cows, what your goals are for the calves, and how these things interact to, to each other to really make an, an effective program all the way around. So it's a good idea to work with your veterinarian on these. I highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah. So following up on this, what is the best method for delivery? Is it nasal, oral, injection? Are there differences? Yeah, so, um, you know, best, best method is beef quality assurance. As one of the trainers for Beef Quality Assurance for the state of Kansas, I always like to go back to that. Uh, where we're trying to reduce blemishes on the carcass. Right? Mm -hmm. That's why we've moved from 
uh, intramuscular to subcutaneous. Yep. Okay, so when given the choice for an injectable product, we want to ensure that we give a subcutaneous dose. Okay, to make sure that we're not ca causing even uh, small carcass blemishes. Um, even, you know, a lot of producers will say, well, doc, does it really matter even if it's a baby calf? Yes, we can still see lesions all the way out to slaughter. Uh, when it comes to the nasals, okay, the nasal uh, vaccines are phenomenal vaccines, but they interact with the body a little bit differently. Okay, uh, when we give the injection, okay, we are directly stimulating the, the circulating immunity. Okay, now with the nasal, we get very active local immunity that happens rapidly, okay? Um, and it's in it, even in very young animals or very stressed animals, we have a reliable response in the nasal cavity where these animals interact with that, uh, that naturally occurring, that, you know, uh, usually a virus, okay? So that is a very useful situation, okay? Now to get the long lasting circulating immunity, Potentially, we would still have to come back and give an injectable uh, later in life. And also keep in mind that uh, with, with the nasals, while they're very good with some pathogens, they may not have all five, okay? Uh, they may be BRSV and IBR, they don't have the, the BVD. So we would still have to give an injectable to be able to get that BV, BVD result, okay? So, uh, so that's where going through and understanding is there a best way um, or best, it's really what our, what our goals are, but the one answer that's very easy is I am or sub Q, always sub Q, okay? It's a good thing to remember. Yeah. So is it a good practice to give vaccines at birth for IBR, BVD, BSRV, or at what age should they be vaccinated for BRD? Yeah, so um, in, in reality, it's, it's, we, we start seeing reli better reliable responses uh, at about a month age. Okay, so uh, are there some products, some of the nasal products we can give at birth? Um, my, my own practice of veterinary medicine, I'm a, I'm a little bit more minimal at birth. I try to rely on the natural, you know, the, the naturally, uh, you know, transmitted uh, vaccine that is colostrum. I try to concentrate with the cow and get it transmitted into the cow as much as possible, rather than me having to intervene soon after birth. Because as all of us know, sometimes it's not the easiest thing to be able to catch some of those baby calves. And when I want to implement a, a strategy, I want to make sure that it's easily followed and every animal gets implemented that's where uh, unless there's a very specific reason I need to I need to administer something at birth I generally wait till that animals a couple of months of age that makes sense yep makes sense so what are your thoughts on feeding tan and root as a supplement before and after birth to help alleviate scours is it useful should you spend your money elsewhere? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, so I, I've seen a lot of a lot of varying, uh, you know, additives and things to be able to feed. And how much is that? Does that implement or change? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a ton of uh, of data. Okay, and I, I always try to lean back on on data. I if if I have a pr producer really question me on some of these things, I feel more most comfortable when we have real real world good trials that show proven data to be able to make a management change. And in, in a lot of these products, we may not have that data to support. Uh, so with that particular product, I can't necessarily say how much benefit or you know what's the cost benefit. Uh, I have not been able to find any, any, uh, any true data to support or deny its use. Uh, and that's where uh, some of these products, they may be very advantageous. We just haven't been able to show the cost benefit yet. Yeah. So a little different route. But is a towel wrapped around a vaccine container sufficient for no direct contact with ice pack whenever you're transporting vaccines? Yeah, no, so uh, a towel wrapped around the ice, making sure that we don't have direct contact, it, it, what, what the uh, referring to direct contact so we don't freeze the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Okay, crumpled up paper, brown paper, uh, you know, having some bubble wrap in between, uh, towel wrapped around them, any of those to prevent the direct contact from the vaccine bile to the ice pack. Mm -hmm. and making sure that we have that line of separation, a clear separation, and re regardless of what that is, we do have a physical barrier between those. We want to keep it cool, but we don't want to freeze it. Yep. Yep, that makes sense. Question about what is the 34-day VAC pre-weaning program or the VAC 34 program? Yeah, so, uh, the, so the VAC 34, that would be uh, uh, usually the, they would have, uh, I believe it's, it's two different rounds. 
-hmm. Okay, and those there's varying amounts, whether it's brand, uh, uh, branding and pre-weaning that they would have uh, documented the, the clostridial and generally the, uh, the five-way modified live, which many of them do specify that they require a modified live for those two different, uh, two, two different time frames. Um, some of them also require a dewormer at the same time. Um, so again, that there's a verified that all of these products were given at two different periods of time prior to weaning and prior to sale. Uh, so that's generally what they would be referring to. Yep. And probably one other key component of that is that that's a program for calves that are not weaned. Correct. Yep. Yep. So thinking about nutrition a little bit, how important is creep feeding to improve calf health? Yeah, so creep feeding, uh, you know, there's a lot of ins and outs when it comes to creep feeding. Um, really, calf nutrition, and I'm not a nutritionist, so I'll be the first one to admit this, when it comes to health, it may not make the biggest impact. Okay, this calf is, is growing uh, early in life. The biggest, you know, biggest thing that that animal needs is mama's milk, right? And then as that animal starts to age and starts to grow, of course, it's still consuming milk, but it's grazing right along mom, okay? Uh, so that calf is still getting nutrition. It's developing its rumen. It's doing a lot of really good things, okay? And it, it all occurs very rapidly. Takes a couple months, but we are growing the rumen, we're growing the immune system, we're growing the calf. Uh, the use of creep feed, uh, while that, that can definitely add gains in performance and things like that, it may not necessarily change um, you know, the overall, you know, unless it's a deficient area where they're not getting some of the essential nutrients, uh, that they're, they're lacking some of the, the macros or micros, uh, you know, it may not make the biggest impact on, on calf health development uh, as much so as it does with performance of that calf. Great information. Yep. So you talked about colostrum, mm -hmm. quality, quantity. Is it a good thing to give a calf extra colostrum on a first calf heifer? Uh, in some circumstances, it might be. We don't have the best data on that right now, okay? Uh, so is that something I can recommend? Hey, if you have a first calf heifer, you need to give a clostridium sup uh, clost or, uh, a colostrum supplement to every single animal. Uh, we can't necessarily say that every time. And two, it's, it, it's very difficult to measure the quality and quantity totally on those first calf heifers. Okay, um, so I, I know that there might be some work that, that is, I know there's been a lot of talk uh, from a lot of different research groups that look further into that. Uh, that is an excellent question and I don't, I haven't been able to come up with a truly correct question, uh, answer to that yet and I hope we get there uh, because that might be able to make it, help us make some better management decisions. Yep. Well, thank you very much for all that information. Um, we're out of time this evening for questions. But if you do have additional questions, don't hesitate to reach out to AJ or myself and we can help answer those. On behalf of the staff at the association, we really thank you for joining us this evening. And we hope you can plan to join us for the next webinar on Tuesday, April 27th at seven o'clock central, where we're gonna be discussing nutritional protocols that are related to getting cows bred and improving conception rates. As we wrap up tonight's webinar, your browser will be redirected to take a survey and we encourage you to provide information on tonight's webinar. This survey will also allow you to submit topic suggestions for future webinars so you can have input in the information that we provide. The full recording of tonight's webinar will be available tomorrow and also emailed out to those who signed up for the webinar or available on angus.org on the homepage by clicking on news and going to Angus University. Feel free to share this webinar with anyone who you think might be interested in the discussion this evening. Again, we thank you for joining us, and AJ, thank you for the presentation, and have a good evening.